In this book of physics video, you'll see a set of simulations depicting the behavior of electromagnetic fields inside of a hollow rectangular conducting waveguide. It's convenient to break down each field into a component that is parallel to the waveguide or the longitudinal component and the components that are transverse to the waveguide. No transverse electromagnetic mode exists for hollow conducting waveguides. Either the magnetic field or the electric field has a longitudinal component. In the case of transverse electric modes, what you see on the board right now, the longitudinal component of the electric field vanishes, but the longitudinal component of the magnetic field does not. In the case of transverse magnetic modes, the longitudinal component of the magnetic field vanishes, but the longitudinal component of the electric field does not. Modes are indicated by writing TEMN and TMMN. By convention, the first index refers to the side that is larger. The dominant mode is TE10. Dominant mode is so-called because that is the mode that propagates at the lowest frequency. In this expression, A is the width of the waveguide and the index M corresponds to that side. In order for a mode to propagate, the driving frequency must be larger than the cutoff frequency of that mode. Boundary conditions are that the tangential component of the electric field vanishes at the surface of the waveguide and the normal component of the magnetic field vanishes at the surface of the waveguide. Consider the dominant mode at some arbitrary time, perhaps time zero. Notice the orientation of the coordinate system. Positive Z points into the screen and consequently positive Y must point down. The electric field everywhere inside the waveguide and for all time either points straight up or straight down. They are straight lines that span the height of the waveguide. For clarity, the electric field lines are drawn only partway across the waveguide. The colors indicate the magnitude of the electric field with yellow represent the peak electric field. Notice that initially the electric field is directed in the positive y direction, but then switches up. Next we see the magnetic field lines. Once again, colors give an indication of the magnitude of the magnetic field. Green represents peak value. Notice the magnetic field lines, as is usually the case for textbook problems, form closed loops. Magnetic field lines are plotted at the midplane, a third of the way up, and a third of the way down. Magnetic field lines have the same shape and the same color. Although the field lines switch directions from loop to loop. Magnetic field lines have no dependence on Y, and each loop lies in a plane. We can apply the two other boundary conditions. That is, there is a discontinuity in the normal component of the electric field at the surface, and there is a discontinuity in the tangential component of the H field at the surface of the waveguide. Charge must appear on the top and bottom inner surfaces of the waveguide because otherwise the electric field would not vanish inside of the conductor as we know it must. No charge appears on the sides of the conductor because there is no electric field component directed sideways. Colors, once again, give an indication of the charge. And here we see the surface currents. surface currents either flow up or down on the sides of the waveguide but follow a curved path on the top and bottom. Let's look at the TE20 mode. We choose a driving frequency that is larger than the cutoff frequency of the TE20 mode. To be sure, the dominant mode will also propagate, but we'll attempt to limit our attention to this particular mode. Just as with the dominant mode, there is no Y dependence. Notice, however, there is one peak and one trough for each Z, with an extreme occurring at X equals A over 4 and X equals 3A over 4. Likewise,
arise from the magnetic field lines, we see two sets of loops spanning the width of the waveguide. And once again, colors give an indication of the magnitude of the magnetic field. And we see here the charge density plotted, and this is with the TE10 mode. No charge appears on the sides of the conductor. And here we see the surface currents. Let's next consider the TE01 mode. This exhibits the same kind of behavior as the TE10 mode, except that the lines are directed sideways from before. Once again, the magnetic field lines form closed loops, but this time they're oriented perpendicular to the TE10 mode. The final transverse electric mode we'll investigate in this lecture is the TE11 mode. The electric field lines lie in planes perpendicular to the waveguide, but they're no longer straight. Rather, they originate on the top or bottom and terminate on the closer side or vice versa. The surface charge is an alternating bands of positive and negative charge. Magnetic field lines exhibit more complicated behavior. They no longer lie in one plane. You have both X and Y components in addition to having a longitudinal component. see the surface currents for this mode. Here we see the solution for the transverse magnetic mode. In contrast to the transverse electric mode, the longitudinal component of the magnetic field here vanishes and the longitudinal component of the electric field does not. The cutoff frequency, however, is the same. Notice, however, that the lowest mode is not a TM10 mode or TM01 mode, those vanish. The lowest mode, in fact, will be TM11. We'll only consider one transverse magnetic mode. The lowest mode is the TM11 mode. The longitudinal component of the magnetic field vanishes this time. And notice how much more complicated the electric field lines are than for transverse electric modes. In contrast, the magnetic field lines form closed loops that lie in planes that are perpendicular to the waveguide. The surface charge density once again appears in bands of alternating positive and negative charge, but notice the difference between this pattern and the pattern for the TE11 mode. And 
Here for the surface currents, we see the simplest pattern yet. Surface current flows only in the z direction and is either positive or negative, depending on z.